Good morning, friends, um, and please uh, keep your Bible open at that uh, last reading from Ephesians chapter 2 or turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if you're able, that'll be helpful. Uh, them and us. Them and us. I wonder how many of the world's problems how many of the challenges of human life, how many of the difficulties in relationships at every level, from individual personal relationships to international conflicts, I wonder how many have at their heart our propensity to see life through this lens, them and us. We're actually living in a time when this has become a kind of ideology. It's sometimes called identity politics, where people are encouraged to think of their identity in terms of some characteristic that they share with certain other people, that's us, over against others who don't share that characteristic, that's them. And it can be a whole range of things, you'll be aware of them, it can be race. And then them and us can become very ugly. It can be nationality, where them and us can lead to war. Or very familiar to us all, I think, is it can be gender, where it becomes men versus women and women versus men in competition. It can be generational, where them and us undermines the mutual love and respect between older and younger people and leads to something like resentment and antagonism. Them and us. Are you familiar with that way of looking at life? Is it in any degree, in any areas, how you really think about life? How you live? Well, we come to our fourth study in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and I want to suggest that we listen very carefully indeed to see how God's word to us this morning rather wonderfully addresses the them and us problem, which really is serious. It's serious in our world today. There are just three things for us to think about this morning. There's often three things, aren't there, in these sermons? There are three again. Uh, Three headings that I hope will take us through our passage. They're unequal in length, but I'm not going to tell you which is long and which is short. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 11 through to 22 we're going to be looking at. And our first heading is this, the dimensions of division. The dimensions of division, where we look at verses 11 and 12. The words before us, uh, we, we, we're aware of this by now, I think, in our, as we're working through our studies. The words before us were written originally to people in Asia Minor. Uh, there's, there's, there's reason to think that this well, may well have been a circular letter that went round a, a number of churches in that area, roughly where Turkey is today. And the people to whom these words were originally written had various racial and cultural and religious backgrounds, but they were people who in these very early days of Christianity had become believing Christians And our passage in verse 11 of Ephesians 2 begins with an invitation to them to remember. See how verse 11 goes? Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Let's just pause there for a moment. Because what Paul is talking about is the deepest division that existed in the human race. 
the most serious us versus them issue. At least that's how he saw it. It was the division between Jewish people and people who were not Jewish, Gentiles. Now this is not, don't mistake this, this is not the ugly modern phenomenon of anti-Semitism. If anything, it was the other way round. This is how Jewish people looked at non-Jewish people. Paul himself, of course, was a Jewish man. And from that point of view, this was the deepest division that there could be between people. And it was expressed, as we see there in verse 11, it was expressed as divisions between people often are in name-calling. Jewish people, you see, prided themselves on the title, the circumcision, which does sound rather odd to us, I know. But it goes back to their ancestor Abraham and the way in which circumcision was given by God as a sign of belonging to God's people. Now, from this point of view, non-Jewish people were called the uncircumcision, or sometimes the uncircumcised. So you've got us the circumcision, and them, the uncircumcision. And we might feel, of course, that that doesn't sound very nice. We might think of other groups of people in our own day who call each other names. It's not uncommon. And quite rightly, I think that sort of thing is generally frowned on these days, though it still happens. Us groups have names for them groups. Here, however, Paul seems to be at pains to point out that the name-calling was not the measure of the actual difference between Jewish people and his non-Jewish readers. Don't just remember what you were called, he writes, remember what you were. So verse 12, remember that you were, at that time, separated from Christ, in the sense that once you Gentiles had no idea about the Messiah, as Jewish people did from their, from their scriptures. You once lived your life, Paul says, with never a thought about God's promised king. Isn't that true? And that's because you non-Jewish people, he writes, were by definition, we're still in verse 12, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The NIV has excluded from citizenship in Israel, which you might have been very happy about as a Greek or a Roman or a whatever, but from the point of view of a Jewish person, like Paul, that meant you were excluded from the chosen people of God, because that's what Israel is. Aliens. That's what you once were, says Paul. And this meant that you were, we're still in verse 12, there's a lot in verse 12, strangers to the covenants of promise. Now again, this mightn't have bothered you in the slightest, but understand that from the Jewish point of view, you were severely disadvantaged people. The covenants of promise refers to the promises that Jewish people understood God had made to them over the centuries, going way back to their ancestor Abraham. Therefore, he says, we're still in verse 12, having no hope. Again, it mightn't have felt like that to you Gentiles, but remember, understand how you were through Jewish eyes. If you knew nothing of God's promises then you had no hope. I mean, what hope could you have? Jewish people knew that God is at work in the world for his people. And that wasn't you. So no matter what you filled your life with, it was quite literally without hope. And this very packed verse 12 finishes off with the words, and without God in the world. See, these Gentile people, they certainly would have been religious, 
but you had nothing to do with the God who really is there, says Paul. You were in the world. You were in the world created by God. You were in the world in which God was active, committed to his promises, but you, you were as far away from God as you could be. See the dimensions of this division in the human race from the Jewish point of view. Just try and think about it. On the one side, there are people who were looking forward to God's promised king. That was almost the biggest thing in their lives, looking forward to the king that God had promised. On the other side, there were people who had no idea, no idea at all about the Christ. On the one side, there were people who belonged to God, Israel. On the other, people who were aliens, as far as Israel was concerned. On the one side, you had people who knew the promises that God had made. And on the other side, you had people who had no idea about God's promises. Us and them. But notice this. Paul does not say what I've been saying from a Jewish point of view. Because, you see, he wants his readers to understand that all of this was once, in fact, true. It wasn't just a point of view. It was the reality. It, it, it's how things were. And, friends, here's the thing. All those things are true of our world today. And that is why there are so many divisions among us. We're going to see this a bit more clearly in just a moment. But all of the us versus thems, they're all symptoms of a deeper problem. Why is it? Why is it, do you think, that we cannot achieve peace in this world? I mean, human beings are very clever people. Don't you reckon we can put people on the moon? We can come up with the most extraordinary solutions to human ills. But still, we can't bring peace to the human race. Why? Does our world, our society, seem to be more and more and more, not less and less and less, divided? Why can't we escape from us and them? The Bible says that it's because of what Paul tells his readers here to remember. Separated from Christ. Excluded from the citizenship of God's people. Foreigners to God's promises, without hope and without God in the world. That's why we're divided. Well, that brings us to our second heading, which is the peace process. The peace process, where we'll look at verses 13 down to 18, the peace process. In verse 13, Paul writes those wonderful words that Bible readers are familiar with, and they're always exciting to read what follows them, the word, but now... But now, so to these non-Jewish people who have become believing Christians, he says, do you realise, do you appreciate what has now happened? Will you please consider this? Verse 13, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you begin to see Paul, the Jewish man, in a profound sense, he had known God all his life. And he says to these non-Jewish people, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you in exactly the same way as he died for me. And suddenly, suddenly, 
Because of the shed blood of Christ, you who once were far away from God, far away from God's King, far away from God's promises, far away from hope, you've been brought near. Jesus' death on the cross has changed everything. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. When he says our peace there in verse 14, he's not talking directly about our peace with God, but our peace with each other. Paul, the Jewish man, and all those non-Jewish people reading his, these words, made us both one. It means no longer two groups of people, but one. No more us and them. Just us. The barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, so to speak, has been broken down. That's what the death of Jesus accomplished. But how has that happened? Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. You see, there was a period of history in the purposes of God when Jewish people were a distinct and separate people. And above all, what made them different was the law of God, the law that God had given them. That law insisted that the Jewish people must not be like the nations, the Gentiles. But when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world, the special God-given law for Jewish people certainly insofar as that law put a wall around Israel, was abolished. And why has that happened? We've got to explore this in some detail, says Paul, because it is so important, still in verse 15, that he might create in himself one new man. That would be better translated, one new humanity. In the place of the two, the divided humanity, so making peace. One new humanity at peace. Peace. That was the purpose, no less, of the death of Jesus Christ. And if we're still thinking, I hope we are, and wondering how does that work, keep reading in verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul applies all of this that he's talking about here to all the divisions in humanity. Male and female, slave and free, and so on and so on and so on across what we might see as the great divisions between people, the us's and the them's, across all those divisions is the cross on which Jesus died to reconcile to God people on both sides of every division, thereby killing dead the hostilities, you see. In other words, verse 17... He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those, this is us, who were near. Jesus Christ brought peace with God to non-Jewish people in exactly the same way as he brought peace with God to us Jewish people. And if that's the case, how can there be anything but Peace between us. Again, verse 18. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. 
That's what Jesus achieved for you and for me, writes Paul. Now let's think about this. Let's think about this, friends, in our us and them world. The death of Jesus Christ is simply monumental for the whole human race and as monumental today as ever. To put it bluntly, if the cross breaks down the dividing wall that existed between Jew and Gentile, then there is no division between human beings that has any right or indeed any strength to withstand the power of the death of Jesus. What happens when men and women, when young and old, when black and white, when Republicans and Democrats, I've just been to the United States, when North Shore and the Shire, we put those two together? Whatever you might think, whatever, whatever division you might think of, when are brought together because both come to God in exactly the same way. What happens when people from different groups understand that they both enjoy peace with God on exactly the same terms? And so a third heading, I'll, I'll tell you this will be brief. Third heading, the outcome is simply wonderful. The outcome is simply wonderful. Paul writes to his non-Jewish readers, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, that is God's people, and members of the household of God. One family, you see. No more them and us. Just us. Put this another way, we, that is you Gentiles and us Jewish people, have become like a strong, solid building. See verse 20? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That is, built on the foundation that the apostles and the prophets laid. Those who first proclaimed this message about Jesus and his death. Christ Jesus, verse 20 still, being uh, himself being the cornerstone, the stone that holds the whole building together. This is a picture of those from every conceivable division of the human race who have come together by coming to Jesus Christ, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The building process continues, you see. It's what's happening here now. As you and I come to Jesus Christ and find peace with God because of Jesus' death for us, we are joined together in him. As the gospel of Jesus Christ and his death calls others and brings others to peace with God, the building rises to become a holy temple so that in him you also, yes, you Gentiles, says Paul, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I wasn't going to do this, but I will. Um, uh, many of you know I was in a church in Auburn before being nice, beautifully invited and privileged to be invited to come and be at St Thomas's. The church in Auburn uh, consisted of folk from almost every nation you could imagine. 
And uh, one day uh, the pastor there, not it wasn't me, but the pastor there uh, preached on a similar theme to what we're looking at today. And as he drew his sermon to a close, as I'm drawing mine to a close, I promise, uh, he did this. He walked down the middle of the church. I hope this doesn't mess up the amplification. And he said, would you all stand up, please? Please stand. Now, just for a moment, just for a moment, I want you to imagine that I'm Jesus. I'm not, but just imagine that I'm Jesus. Now, what I want you to do is to move closer to Jesus. Come on, shuffle along, just, just a little bit closer. Now, stop. What happened as you moved closer to Jesus? Did you notice that? And as we did this in the church in Auburn, an African and an Indian looked at each other. They'd drawn closer together. And a man from the Middle East and a man from the islands of the Pacific moved closer together. And all of us, I can tell you, tears welled up in our eyes as we realised as we come closer to Jesus, we come closer to each other. Ain't that something? Please sit down again. And friends, I... It is certainly the case, it seems to me, and I'm sure this is true, and I've been astonished at the number of people who are grasping this, who are not necessarily Christian people, that the deep divisions in our world today between people that are troubling so many of us, the hostilities that are tearing our societies apart, yeah, the divisiveness of identity politics, all of that is connected to the widespread rejection of the peace with God that has been made possible by Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are a lot of issues that are more complicated than that, but that is the heart of the matter. And I want to conclude by just asking you, each one of you, do you know the peace with God that brings peace with other people? You see, this is so powerful, it cannot be a simply individual thing. You and God. No, it's more powerful than that. Even more powerful than that. Do you know the forgiveness that enables you to forgive? Do you know the love that makes it possible for you to love? Do you know the access to our Heavenly Father that brings people together? And I think I want to close by just saying, if not, what are you waiting for? Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of Christ. And this morning we thank you for the way in which the cross of Christ has brought us together. As we have been brought to God and the hostility between us and our God has been broken down. All those hostilities between us become nothing. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that we might know this in our experience more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.